Are you ready for an adventure? Here's a chance for you to experience part of the Pioneer's overland journey on the actual wagon road. After nearly 2,000 miles, the Pioneer's journey on the Oregon Trail ended at the Columbia River in the Dalles, 100 miles short of their destination. To reach the fertile lands of the Willamette Valley, their only option was to navigate down the treacherous Columbia River. Some lost their lives and many lost their belongings as their rafts overturned. They could hire passage down the river, but most pioneers found the cost of $50 per wagon and $10 per person exorbitant. There also were not enough rafts, so there was a log jam of pioneers waiting and depleting their resources. When Barlow arrived in 1845, he was determined to find another safer, cheaper route. He joined forces with fellow pioneers Joel Palmer and William Rector to explore a route over the mountains. Palmer and Barlow learned of trails on the south side of Mount Hood used for generations by the indigenous people for trade and resource gathering purposes. While none had yet used this route for wagons, Barlow and Palmer determined by their initial survey much of the trail could be adapted for their needs. The Barlow Road is located on lands ceded to the United States federal government by the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs of Oregon in the treaty with the tribes of Middle Oregon in 1855. Travel on the road from the Dalles to its toll gate, which is near present-day Womack, was through open rolling hills. It passed through Tai Valley, which at that time was a Native American community. The pioneers then traveled west up the hill to what is now the town of Womack, but at that time was unsettled. They prepared their wagons, grazed and rested their animals at Great Creek, site of the toll gate, before embarking on the strenuous journey ahead. We will start our journey on the southwest side of the Gate Creek Crossing. This road up to the Barlow Pass Summit is walkable, drivable for street legal vehicles, or rideable by horseback or bikes. Come and explore. You'll have an adventure, learn a little history, and experience an amazing change in the environment as you travel the road from the east to the west. Nearly three quarters of the pioneers who came off the Oregon Trail eventually chose the Barlow Trail over the passage down the Columbia River. This led them to Gate Creek where Sam Barlow established his toll gate. Here Mr. Barlow was stationed with a few men to take toll from the immigrants. He said to pay him for work in the road through the Cascade Mountains. He charged five dollars per wagon which some of the immigrants paid, some gave their notes, and others drove right along without doing either. The road from Gate Creek runs alongside a huge meadow. Many pioneers spent several days resting and grazing their livestock, as well as preparing their wagons for the journey ahead. After the first mile or so of climbing, there is an informal camping area where Road 170 joins the Barlow. In this fairly open area, you'll see a grove of incense cedar trees among the ponderosa pine. The road continues for another three miles to Immigrant Springs, the direction these walkers and this biker are heading. For the pioneers traveling by oxen or mule-pulled wagons, this would have been the first water for their livestock after a climb of about 1,000 feet since leaving Gate Creek. Notice there are fir trees, dogwood, ocean spray, and a variety of wildflowers on the forest floor. The forest has become denser. Immigrant Springs, shown here in this old photograph, was an important water source, not only to the Native Americans and immigrant travelers, but later to the cavalry and the sheep herders. This is a good rest stop because the road gets much harder as you continue westward. Traveling to Forest Creek, the road is steeper. The first mile after Immigrant Springs, you climb 300 feet. 
Then the next two miles, you drop over 500 feet. You first pass the Lost Boulder Irrigation Ditch. Dropping down farther, you encounter a beautiful stream called Lost Creek. This cyclist loved the technical challenge of this particular stretch of the Barlow with the roots and rocks. But imagine the immigrants trying to descend this with heavily laden wagons. I could never have imagined such roads, nor could I describe it for it beggars description, over roots and branches, stumps, rocks, fallen trees and logs, over streams, through sloughs and marshes, uphill and downhill, and in short, everything that could possibly tend to make it intolerable. About a mile farther from Lost Creek, you come to a beautiful small campground that has several creekside campsites. For many immigrants, this would have been the end of their first day of travel on the Barlow. Tomorrow, they would be facing an even steeper descent to White River. Leaving the cold, clear water of Forest Creek, the road climbs a short distance over rocky terrain and then descends a bit before another climb to an altitude of about 3,400 feet. In the fall, when the pioneers would have traveled this road to the Willamette Valley, the maples turn brilliant red, orange, scarlet, and yellow. The canopy of color surrounding those early travelers was no doubt a welcome respite before the challenging descent ahead. The pioneers referred to this next steep section as Little Laurel. Laurel Hill was the dreaded 60% grade on the west side between Government Camp and Rhododendron that proved to be the most difficult hill of the 2,200 mile Oregon Trail. In going down the hill to the river, which was very steep and rocky, my team was so tender footed they could not hold back. So they ran down like streaks, scattering most of the load at the fore end of the wagon, but did not do much damage. Going down this hill, you'll notice several springs with signs naming three of them. The one at the top is named Charity. The two below are Hope and Faith. At the bottom of the hill, you'll see a camping area with access to the river. The road is level here and sand filled, easy going for our modern ways of travel, but hard for the weary oxen to pull their wagons through. Before the road was built, when the Barlow, Rector, and Palmer parties were trying to get their wagons through the mountains, William Barlow described how they did it. He said the Blazers, Palmer, Rector, Barlow, and others went ahead, finding the best route and marking trees usually with an ax. These marks were called blazes. A group of cutters followed using rusty and dull saws and axes to widen the route and last came the wagons with the drivers, women, and children. It was in this White River Sands area that the blazes came to an end and the wagon parties waited for several days for the trailblazers to return. At last the men returned, weary and hungry, but with a plan. Palmer, by hiking high on Mount Hood in the Mississippi Head area, had spotted a pass, but because of the coming snow and dense forest, they would not have time to build a road for the wagons. They would need to build a cabin big enough for their belongings and for the supplies needed for two men to stay and watch over them. The rest would travel by foot or horseback to Oregon City. These first pioneers had successfully descended Little Laurel and they had a plan on how to get to Oregon City, but they still had a cabin to build and another day's travel to get their livestock to grass at Summit Meadow, as well as a strenuous journey through snow to get to the settlements.
This seven mile segment of the Barlow Road is rich in both beauty and history. We'll continue our journey going east to west, just as the Barlow Party did in searching for a way to Oregon City. Your passage by car is blocked by a temporarily failed bridge at Barlow Crossing. But you can access this section from the Barlow Pass Summit. The road leaves the White Sands next to White River and continues up through a forested area following Barlow Creek. You won't always be able to see the bubbling stream because of the dense underbrush, but its sounds will accompany you along this stretch of the road. About halfway to the top, there will be three campsites on your left with picnic tables. Fort Deposit, the cabin the Barlow parties built for storage, is thought to be in this area. This part of the Barlow Road is the easiest driving, but be prepared for water. High clearance or four-wheel drive vehicles are preferred. The road continues on for another three miles to Devil's Half Acre. It is now a beautiful meadow with wildflowers blooming and camping spots bordering it in the trees. Back during the pioneer time, it was an area of burned tree stumps and snags, and they called this area the Big Deadening. The road continues climbing for another mile to the summit. Here you'll notice ferns, cedars, huge rhododendrons that bloom in early summer, tall lilies, and of course, large Douglas fir. Barlow and a crew of road builders came back when the snow melted to begin building the road on the west side of the mountain range. They completed the road by August of 1846 in time for the first westward immigrants to use it. The road ends for modern travelers at the Barlow Pass Summit parking lot. Summit Meadows, which provided the first food for livestock after leaving Gate Creek, is south about two miles. As you travel this road now, consider what these two or three days of travel on this segment might have been like for the immigrant travelers. Think also about the impact on the indigenous population, who initially greeted and helped the immigrants with food, river passage, and directions. The road had a succession of owners through the years, and in 1861 it became two-way, providing passage for eastbound home seekers as well as westbound immigrants. The Barlow Road served Oregon travelers for 73 years. 